name is Drew and I'm a psychotherapist here in New York City and today we're going to talk about the Enneagram Explained. Just a video on how to understand the Enneagram in general. I get this all the time from clients and from those of you who have found me over the year and a half that I've been doing this. Do you have a video just so I can help my friends understand this, my family understand this, or I don't understand how to, to make sense of this myself. So I'm going to try to make the Enneagram understood, seen, and known better. It is always my goal to help you feel seen, known, and understood better. And today I just want to serve you up a better relationship with the Enneagram. So I hope to do this well. I'm going to give you seven different ways to look at the Enneagram and then hopefully they integrate and start flowing together. So you have some tools on how to know this and how to explain this, or you could just pass this video on to your friends and family who are trying to understand this for the first time, or you've been trying to convince, and they just have been resistant because the Enneagram has a weird name, and it might feel way too close to astrology, and pentagram, and enneagram sound similar. I get it. It's hard. I've had a tough time over the years understanding it myself, but I hope that I've packaged this pretty well for you. Over the years, I've come up for, with some ways that are unique, I think, to the way I see it, that I want to pass on to you. So this is some original content that I'm throwing out there, and it's not just regurgitated information. Uh, I, I think here, I can only be so comprehensive. I already do long videos. It already poops you guys out and annoys you probably that it, you have to watch these long videos if you so choose to, and I challenge you to stay for the whole thing but I don't want to be overly comprehensive. So there's gonna be some things I leave out. I'm gonna leave out a bit on spirituality. I'm gonna leave a bit out on sacred geometry and how math works into this thing. And I'm gonna leave out uh, just some of the stuff that make it so in the woods that we lose ourselves, like, make, like the history of this thing. But I will say that since the 60s and 70s, the Enneagram has been developed and understood with more psychological examination and critique. And so it's become more academic and scholarly and criticism has been put up against it. And so people have been evaluating, adding, and now it seems to be accepted universally in the psychological world. So we have to understand when we take this test that we get to play with it a little bit. It might not hit the first time for you. You might not feel like your number is the right number. I'd actually challenge you, even as you're trying to understand or, or take in the content that I'm giving you today, that you are seeing it in a certain way that's different than other people, and that's probably connected to your number. But this is not sorcery. I know that there is some suspicion behind the Enneagram, and I'm going to try to, to dissuade you from that and get you a bit more comfortable with it. If you are watching, you may be in a tough spot. A lot of people who start to dig deep and delve into this type of uh, tool are, are really in a place where they're grappling with something. So if you are, I'm going to challenge you to be comfortable with humiliation. It's just the idea of being humbled. Investigating yourself is a humbling process. And the Enneagram, I found more than any other personality profile as a tool, is humbling. A lot of the other tests are great, and they're great entryways. I think this goes a bit deeper, and this makes us look at some of the realities of ourselves in a way that can feel really scary and then make us look ugly. So be patient with yourself. This tool unravels who you are over time, and as you get deeper in, there is layers to it that I think you'll start to appreciate. I challenge you to watch a video I did on the social stances, centers of intelligence, and subtypes. Most people find out their number and then they stop there. But there's layers to this that make you way more known to yourself than you ever thought you could be. As a therapist for 20 years and a client for 21 years, 22 years, I became a therapist right uh, a little bit after I started getting therapy. I found that this tool really magnified all the work I had done on myself and then gave me some new insight that was profound to me. This is why I've spent so much time trying to teach it. Remember, 
The Enneagram is just a framework for understanding yourself and others. And it's a description of your personality. But it is also, and this is the most profound thing, a growth, maturity, and transformational tool. It doesn't just say, here's the description. It says, here's the prescription too. Here's how you can work on your things. Here's how you can be conscious to what's going on. That you're not unaware or just reflexive in life. That you are not just uncritical or programmed, but that you carry the weight of awareness and not carry the ignorance strategies. We must be obedient to the work that is needed for us to get the best out of ourselves. Not obedient to the strategies that keep us from ourselves. And, and the Enneagram points those out. It says, here's what you're in denial of. Here's what you put a lot of awareness on. And because you put that awareness on those things, these are your compulsions. These are your obsessions. You must go beyond them. So all, not only highlight what your best stuff is, it'll highlight what your worst stuff is. And this is why it's so scary for people to get into this kind of work, to try to understand who they are. So that's why they usually come to it when they are broken. Maybe you aren't, maybe you're not in a bad place. You just are in a good place. And you want to get more and more understanding of self. Cool. Let's go on that journey together. I think the beauty also of the Enneagram is it is redemptive. It is about grace. It's about being compassionate to yourself and not beating yourself up so that you can heal, revive, and be aware. All right. Again, my name is Drew, therapist here in New York. If you want to work with me individually, give me a holler. I work with people uh, from YouTube all the time, all over the world, and I'd love to at least talk to you about that. And otherwise, enjoy this journey. I hope that it just gives you some tools to understand the Enneagram a little bit more. Let's jump in. All right. What does the Enneagram mean? It is a weird word, but it is from the Greek, two words put together, ennea, meaning nine, and gramma, meaning written down or drawn. So this is just nine different types. And it's not meant to be the end all, be all. It is a useful tool, just like other typologies. So right now we're going to get into the study of typology, the discipline of typology, of putting characteristics, constellations of ways humans do things together to create these different types. And is it reductionist? Yeah. It reduces us a bit. It's not all comprehensive or encompassing. We are frighteningly complex people. And we have to hold ourselves in a regard there that we are way bigger and more complex than any typology. But this is one that's pretty powerful. And it's not intended to limit us, but liberate us and free us by giving us more information about ourselves. And it is not about boxes. People get really worried that this is gonna put me in a box. You can never be put in a box. If you are an Enneagram type, right? Say you're a four like myself, and I am the color red. I am one shade of red that no other red exists like me. I'm way too uh, unique to be put into one huge category, but this helps narrow it down a little bit so that we can start working on ourselves to confront our compulsions uh, and to also celebrate our gifts. It's part of what the Enneagram is so powerful to do. It basically helps us understand our human or psychological topography, the different contours inside Drew, the subterranean regions and the things you see and the things you don't see. It is a map. It's just a mapping tool. I had a client say, how do I explain this to people so I don't seem crazy? And I'm like, tell them to go read any fiction book. The characters that are developed by the writers usually have constellation of characteristics that if you look through the time of, of fiction writing, of the history of writing, they will mimic Enneagram numbers because these are true about who we are. So instead of warping and thinking like this is a whole new thing and the Enneagram is 
radical in the sense that it's creating these character types. No, the character types were always there. It's just helping us see them. And this is about self-awareness towards compassion and kindness to self. There's a kindness component in the Enneagram that I haven't seen in a lot of the other typologies because it is very prescriptive, not just uh, diagnostic. It doesn't just say, these are the things you are. It says, this is how you can work on yourself. I'm going to get into that further, but it is not just a mapper of life and who you are. It is a transformer and an evolver. It moves us from reactivity to responsiveness and a certain level of predictability of what we will do, how we operate in the world. And it focuses our attention there and says, you can work on this so you're not so habitually motivated and acting with ignorance, but more intentional and deliberate. Now, I'll say this. There is an equality to the Enneagram. No number is better than any other number, except for maybe the fours. I'm a four. I like to think that we're better. No, we are not. It's all equal. So you can dethrone yourself over thinking your number is the better number. And don't spend misapplied attention to hating your number. This thing is actually meant to, again, give you more freedom and then broaden you out so you look at all the numbers and you start integrating some of the gifts of all of them. You are not ultimately your number or meant to be. It's a good starting point. And we can find out what our habitual components are, our defense mechanisms, our compulsions, our focus of energy is. But then we have to move on and broaden out. Now, when we're talking about typology, we're thinking about some of the ways in which we have come to be us. So that could be, you know, temperament and disposition. Well, where does that come from? Some of its cultural influences, some of its genetics, there's a narrative here too, the trauma that we experience. Um, what's going on in the time that we're born? All of these types of things. And it's, it's both objective and it's analytical. And we're trying to be unbiased when we're looking at these. So how can we account for all the genetically encoded components here? We, we can't really. But we do know that out of the womb, there are certain things that we are presenting pretty quickly. And then... There's an environment and a culture and, and these things start to mix. So one of the things we have to concentrate on and focus on, which we'll do in the future here, is talk about trauma and how trauma affects us, about how our family affects us. But we instantly internalize the world and certain idealized, idealizations that we see around us and we internalize them, bring them in, and then start living a certain way and avoiding certain things. These are where the defense mechanisms get created. So how much of it's programmed? We don't know. How, mo how much of it's from our environment? We don't know. But the environmental stuff is pretty easy to see when you have keen eyes focused on it. Again, these are just nine archetypes. And an archetype is just like a, a consistent thing throughout time that shows up. So these are nine different types that seem to show up throughout humanity. If we go read history books, we can kind of start typing people. Now, we can only get so precise without being with them, without them reporting to us. But this, this tool kind of gives us a key to start unlocking what our core motivations are and our emotionality towards the world. How do we respond to the world? And we give it regard. None of it's insurmountable. And we have to be a bit unsentimental when we're looking at it. It is a cruel punishment to overly uh, project onto ourselves some kind of uh, devalue or value and when we become a bit more objective and unsentimental, we can work on these a bit more. Now, just for history's sake, I'm not going to go fully into this, but it seems that the Enneagram started to gain some uh, chirpings like these birds behind me in the early 1900s. And then in the 60s, some people from South America started developing it more. 
And we kind of got this idea that it's a pseudoscience. It's something that's starting to develop. It hasn't been tested too well. And it's up for interpretation and people were adding on to it. And then as it started to gain its grounding in the 70s and 80s, it started growing acceptance and use in the psychology world and in the world of helping humans grow. Theologians, psychologists, this world started mixing together. And then that inner seeking component started to be understood a bit and added on to. So this isn't that weird comparatively to any other typology. It's something that somebody came up with and started to develop a little bit. And then other people started to develop a little bit and started using it and seeing how it worked. And it was started to be tested by people who were just critical. And it still is. And the beauty of it is it's painstaking work. So the people who are going into it are going into it and digging into themselves and going into the plumbing the depths of themselves, confronting their underworld, their subterranean regions. So give it a little credit because the people who came before Drew and everyone else who's helping you understand yourself have gone into their own depths because the Enneagram doesn't let you not do that. I know that's a double negative. The Enneagram doesn't let you outrun your compulsions and your passions and your uh, idiosyncrasies that get in the way. So the human strivings that both affect us in a healthy way and affect us in an unhealthy way have been examined by a lot of the people who came before us that have explored this world. So they are your friends, they are the trailblazers, and they used all kinds of things that had already been trailblazed. So this is why I value it. I give it respect because I know that the people who became before me dug into the depths of themselves and, and gave themselves the attention needed to work on their crap. And that's the beauty of this thing. The discipline of hamartiology. Drew, don't do this to us. Do we have to talk about sin? Yes, we have to talk about sin. We can use a whole bunch of words for it. Passions, traps, uh, dislocations from self. But for this part, the study of sin, hamartiology, and why am I filming this with huge clouds behind me? Because censured behind those clouds are the grandeur of the Alps, the peaks of the Alps. If you've watched any of my videos, you know that the Alps are back there ready to be seen, ready to be enjoyed, but the clouds come in. And that is the metaphor I wanna use here is that our true self is clouded by the things that preoccupy us. And so we have to talk about sin. Now, I know many of you are coming from weird religious backgrounds and all kinds of messages you've gotten through your life. I want you to kind of get off and enjoy the exploration of sin right now, not in the sense of guilting you and making you feel small and trapped in it, or that you will be punished in the hellfire damnation experience of molten lava and stuckness, but that as the clouds start to clear, your true self starts to emerge and our sin, our passion, our fixations, our distractions become more known to us. We become less ignorant to them. So how we kind of do life is very motivated by these nine passions. And these nine passions were developed by the Desert Fathers, started off as eight back in like the 300s, 400s, when the uh, Christians fled Rome, went out into the deserts, into the mountains, into the places that weren't occupied by tons of humans and tons of institutions. And they came up with these ideas of things that keep us stuck. The deadly sins. Started off as eight, turned to seven. Now we have nine with the Enneagram. We are deeply prejudiced by one of them. And if you're on the borderline, maybe two really got their grips on you. If you're borderline between two numbers, they are distracting thoughts that keep us disconnected from ourself, from our true self that is those mountains and clouded and keep us locked into the false self. And what we need to do is just get a, a grip on it. See how this, this influences us. 
how does this give meaning to our life? And, and how did it protect us? How, did this, how does it help us navigate life? And we use this sin kind of a, as a crank or a lever to get a stronghold on ourself, to feel confident. And we use this early on in life to gain kind of, uh, how would I say, um, worth, just worth. It's kind of like our precious. In uh, Lord of the Rings, Gollum has, has the ring and it's, it's his precious. And so we have our precious. Interesting note, Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth, was designed after this place called Lauterbrunnen, which is not too far away in the Alps with the peaks on each side and waterfalls. And it's kind of like that here. So hamartiology comes from the word hamartia. And hamartia means to miss the mark. Think about archery and you're shooting that arrow and it goes left of center or right of center. We veer, uh, we sway, we go off course. In Greek tragedy, the character flaws that get the plot going, get the pra pra uh, protagonist screwed, you know, stuck in the muck and mire of life. Dante in Dante's Inferno, uh, Dante says, the inner trouble that incites a movement of spirits towards a tragic end. And us as the audience feels something for the character. Pity, our compassion is, is incited. And we grow in this kind of understanding of our common heritage as screwed up people. Screwed up people who all have flaws and all get stuck in these thought processes that are kind of ugly. The word is also used in the New Testament. Yes, if you have your religious baggage, let's go to it. The New Testament in Romans, St. Paul says, all have sinned, all have hamartiaed. Everyone is under the power of hamartia, also says in Romans. Error in our ways, an ignorance about how we are moving in the world, a lack of information. And what it does is it keeps us at a low level of awareness of suffering in ourselves and what drives us. So never underestimate this subtle, subtle, subtle suffering that you're experiencing from this sin that kind of preoccupies this, this passion, this trap that you get stuck in kind of like quicksand and it controls us we are missing the mark and it must be dealt with but it usually has to be dealt with very very uh indirectly because on your deathbed you will still struggle with this stuff i tell everyone that comes into my office that when you are dealing with your primary passion, your primary trap, your primary sin. Mine's envy. On my deathbed, I'm going to be sitting there, passing away. I know it's very sad for you to think about, but I'm going to still struggle with envy. My goal, though, is to chip away at it slowly and methodically. Because it is so tempting and promising to me, it builds me up. If I can kind of think about how I can become a superhero by seeing what's missing in my life and what other people have and want to grab it for myself, then it kind of helps me keep separate from reality. And so why do we have to go through it, grow at it indirectly? Because if we kind of try to get it dismissed entirely, it will maybe even grab more of a stronghold. If I try to rid myself of envy altogether, I actually might become even more envious. I see the people who seem to deal with things better. So what I have to do is come to a place and say, this is going to be with me. And it's going to have its place on the stage at times. And I have to have a moment where I go, have your jokes, but you don't get to, to fill up the full hour. You get one or two jokes and you're out. And when I was a younger man, there was a half the set was my envy. And now I'm dwindling it down to a couple jokes and then I say, all right, get off the stage. And what that looks like is it, it might last for a little while and I know it's going on. I'm not ignorant to it. And I go, okay, have your way. Now let's move on. I have to let you go off now. 
We first start getting acquainted with hamartia from Aristotle in his Poetics. He's talking about Greek tragedy. And in Greek tragedy, there is this juncture between the character and the character's actions and behaviors. And Aristotle says this, Character in a play is that which reveals the moral purpose of the agents, i.e. the sort of thing they seek or avoid. The sort of thing they seek or avoid. That's kind of what our passion does. It helps us avoid feeling small, avoid feeling insignificant, and helps us find the thing that gives us purpose or feels like it gives us worth. And we need this at a younger age. In our 20s, 30s, in our teens, it forms us and makes us feel special and unique and gives us worth. And it's a self-defensive component. In 40s and after, it starts to not work as well. We're clutching too hard to it. And so in these plays that Aristotle is talking about, Greek tragedy, the character is never overly righteous or overly evil. And what happens is a hamartia comes into play and then the tragic error happens. And this is where we have to not be ignorant to how our lives can be clouded by this thing that keeps us from true self. Hamartia is also a medical term. Not many people know this. A focal malformation consisting of disorganized arrangement of tissue types. Huh? Okay, let me say this again. A focal malformation, it's focused on this one area, consisting of disorganized arrangement of tissue types. Goes on to further say, tissue types that are typical to an anatomical area, but arranged in an atypical manner. I love this metaphor here, because it kind of suggests that we're all going to have them. We all have got this tissue inside of us, but there's this one focal point in which something's disorganized it just is arranged wrong and it might have devastating effects on our body now to the point of well we only have this one sin we struggle with no you struggle with all nine you definitely struggle with all nine one just has a bit more power makes you a bit more blurry to yourself it makes uh you a bit like you're impeaching the true self. Just like the clouds, oh, I see it. The clouds are starting to to open up a little bit and are revealing more of that mountain. But the peak is still not there. And this is the slow work of just digging and digging so we can see the irrevocable awe in ourselves. But we have a sick fidelity towards our torturer, our sin. It had served us so well, the envy made me pursue uniqueness and originality. It worked. I'm kind of unique and original. I got an authenticity about me because that four part, because I'm a four, the envy motivated me to be something special. Now, if I hold on to that thing too hard and I grip it and the envy keeps on following me on life and rules me and I'm ignorant to it, then I... As I grow, I cease to have that same uniqueness. It becomes aware on myself. It becomes aware on other people. This is where we have to say, hey, get off the stage. I see you. It's going to be scary if you stay here too long. So why are we going to become this homartiologist? We have to be the homartiologist so we are not ignorant, oblivious, arrogant, and also shamed about our sin, about our passions, about these traps, that we understand them, we're aware of them, we're aware that they're going to happen for the rest of our lives, all nine, but specifically this one or two that are going to really get a grip on you, and you see it, and you have a little chat with it, and you ain't dumb to it, and what happens is those clouds start to to lift, And we start to see more of that mountain and we start to see more of those mountain peaks and we start to be able to climb those mountains and live out of our true self and become more humble. I hope I explained that well. Peace. Peace be with you.
peace be with you. Let's talk about anxiety mitigation. Yes, exposure therapy, the discipline of exposure therapy. Did you think I was not going to include some kind of therapy in this process? I found it. It is the slow and methodical movement and desensitization towards a fear that we have. So say we have an anxiety disorder. You might be afraid of certain things specifically. Let's just say it's a spider or a snake or, or water, the ocean. And a trusted practitioner will take you and introduce this fear at greater and greater levels as you get more and more comfortable with the fear. Why am I bringing this up with the Enneagram? Because we are naturally afraid of our dark side, afraid of our stuff, the things that we have in our shadow. We have a bit of a fear towards that. And the Enneagram makes us face our fear. But hopefully, it is at a strategic time in our life where we're ready for it. This is why you hear a lot of people talk about the Enneagram should not be introduced to people too young. I have differing uh, opinions on that. I think it's a maturity level that is needed and also a readiness level. There's certain people who are just ready for the truth at different times, but the truth when it comes to the Enneagram will make you feel naked and will make you feel a bit humiliated. When we deny some of the junk in our life and then we kind of have these strategic plans to protect ourselves, when we are faced with that, it can be tremendously painful. Now, I'm not somebody who digs flattery too well. I like flattery. Let me reframe that. I don't like something very fluffy and overly flattery uh, oriented. And so the Enneagram was pretty powerful for me when I first got involved in it. Now, I had already been in therapy so long, so I didn't have the experience a lot of people have when they find out their number, they feel like, ugh, this is disgusting. I already felt like I had gotten over the disgusting stuff a long time ago. And when I looked at the Enneagram, it actually was a mirror image of a lot of the therapy things that I had been focusing on, the imperatives in therapy that I had been working on for 10, 15, 20 years were exact replications in what the Enneagram 4 struggles with. And so I didn't feel so degraded and small when I started reading the, the highlights of the Enneagram 4. A lot of people do because it's a, one of their first entryways into dealing with themselves. So it could be crushing, it could be harsh. But this is what you get exposed to with the Enneagram. And it slowly and methodically works on you. It's not meant to give you everything up front. We, we, we kind of like pull apart, just like an onion, different layers of the Enneagram as you are getting more and more ready for that kind of work. So the more we have control and try to keep control in life, the less we win. So the Enneagram kind of works by saying, hey, pain and suffering are okay. You can be explo exposed to them. You can be exposed to a lack of certainty and a lack of clarity. And you can self-empty a bit and see how you're divided in life. See what you despise and what you put into the background, what you hide from others. And then it's going to say, hey, you've pointed the finger at other people. You've said, hey, I, I, I see the... Uh, the, the, the log in your eye, but you really had a log in your eye, not just a splinter. And this is where we start seeing how we judge others based on how they live. And we have to get broken a bit here. So when you're facing the hidden denied side, it will be humiliating and make you feel naked. And you're going to have to approach that by dealing with this fear of self. It is a truth drug. And you will feel a bit vulnerable, maybe a bit anxious, but hopefully also ambitious in exposing yourself to this fear and actually desensitizing to the fear of self. Seeing what your pathological strivings are and then committing to ungripping yourself from that death hold. It is subversive. It will work. 
and it will get inside and dig deep into you. But while it first acts as if it's someone taking you hostage, it then starts to be reframed as kind of a SWAT team coming to your rescue. It works to support you. And this is what the, the therapist does in exposure therapy. They, they know the game and they're methodically taking you into that place of fear with a bunch of confidence. And so the Enneagram is confident about what it can help you with. And then you have to kind of trust it that it's going to reveal more and more to you. It's a movement towards honesty of self. And this is why so many people resonate so strongly with it. Although it feels a bit humiliating and a, and a bit like a, a harsh uh, critic. And you might feel a bit degraded. And by degraded, I mean you take yourself off the pedestal a bit and go, oh, a lot's been exposed here. And then that stripping of you comes into play. You still realize it is an honest assessment. Why it reveals and it makes me a little naked. It also gives me a strategy to work through that. And I can be a regular guy, regular gal, regular person who's just working on their crap. And this is why it's so compelling to people. Because it's not bullshit. It's honest. It doesn't fluff you up. It's just not a strengths finder. Here's your strengths. You're so great. It goes, no, 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 no. Here's your strengths and your weaknesses. And so your egocentrism has to get diminished. And even your poor perception of self. I've had so many people watch my videos and go, thank you. It's actually opening me up to be more creative, up to being more myself. I was actually afraid to bring this to the front because I felt like I would be humiliated like I was when I was young or picked on or, or somebody was going to critique me or, or make me feel small. And so this is the golden shadow stuff. This is what Carl Jung called the golden shadow, the good stuff in our shadow that we hide away because we think the world won't understand it or appreciate it. And often they won't, but you still have to go give it. And so there's just as much revealed in the good stuff that we're hiding that we think the world won't accept. That's even a humiliating part. You might be humiliated by how much you haven't given back to the world because you were afraid it would be judged and critiqued and you'd made, be, made to be feel small or insignificant. So it doesn't flatter in that way either. It exposes you methodically to how you've hidden your gifts. And it's disturbing and accurate in that way. And it even shows your gift based on your number and says, hey, have you been utilizing this enough? So there should be a beautiful, distressing component to this and make you ambitious about finding that stuff that you hid away, a curiosity to thrive and a promise to yourself to explore more so that, yeah, you could work on the dog shit, but you could also work on the gold, the stuff that you hid. And with loving, compassion, kindness, grace, just like that therapist would walk you through that hard stuff and expose you to the things that you're afraid of. It is a positive constraint, the Enneagram. A positive constraint. Kind of, in a positive way, keeps us from doing the same things over and over again that don't work. So as we do the untangling, we also have to know that some of the undressing is going to happen. We're feel like a naked person in front of an audience, and that's okay. You can handle it. You're probably at a point where you're mature enough or ready enough to deal with this stuff. That's why the Enneagram came to you. I do believe that there is some kind of like, it finds you when it's supposed to find you. There will be a wilderness. There will be some crisis. There will usually be doldrums that bring you there. But the message will be sent. You can work on your stuff and find both the gold and also the crap and work on both. All right. Go work on both, damn it. We are now going to jump into the discipline of psychoautobiography. Yes, writing your story. This is what happens when people come into me, see some uh, therapist-y guy and say, I need to figure out my life. Like something happened that either willfully they came, came in or frustratingly they came in to figure out their lives. And what we have to do is kind of go 
do some psycho archaeology. We have to dig up the bones and say, from where did you come and who are you now? Now, this is also mixed in with originology, the study of origins, the beginning of us, you know, or the beginning of the world, the Big Bang, or whatever it is that you are trying to study the origins of. This is kind of a broader originology. And for us, I'm not going to get too deep into nature versus nurture. I'm going to do a video on that. I get that question all the time. But let's look a little bit at our lives and say, why are we the way we are? And usually what happens is this frustration point comes and you decide, I want to change my mind. I want to transform. I see certain things that are mistakes and flaws, and I know they have something to teach me. And maybe that's this moment for you. You're starting to to learn about your life and the Enneagram came up and now you're really digging deep and you want to be go, go beyond where you are now. And you start asking the questions like, who was I back then? Who was I from before the age of five? How did I come out? And what made me who I am today? And one of the things we have to explore here, which is gonna really help us is know what are our unconscious motivations? Unconscious motivations determine your type of Enneagram number. And what I really mean is how are you in a social scheme kind of trying to play with the world to build yourself up? And the major questions you have to ask yourself is what, what do I pay a lot of attention to? And then pay attention to what you pay attention to. I'm a four. My biggest fear, as long as I can remember, is being mediocre. And what motivates a four? Envy. That's the leverage point. And it's that I see things that are missing in my life and I see them in other people and I kind of want to absorb them. And there's a certain pain that comes from knowing that I don't have everything. And I'm constantly focused on what I'm missing. And so the unconscious motivation is to create this unique, dynamic, original character. That's the solution, that's the salvation, that's the survival mechanism. And so I can actually get clouded by, and distracted by my desire for that too much because I don't realize what I already have. So I have to pay attention to what I pay attention to. Now, like all of you, I wanted the magic pixie dust when I started doing the psycho autobiography work because there was pains in my life that I wanted solutions to quick. And today I will get a client that comes into my office and they want to know how to fix themselves very quickly. This doesn't happen. <laughs> this is a practice of investigation. We don't have the emotional bandwidth to take in all of the problems in us very quickly or all the solutions to those problems. It's a slow, methodical work. And there's certain things that are blocked from us intentionally. And we have to have compassion for ourselves in that process because it is a hard slog. And that's why writing a biography, authors will tell you, it's a slow, methodical work that takes years and years and years. So you think that to look at your own autobiography won't be that crazy. But you will be sweetly rewarded, even though you're grudgingly going into this, as you start figuring out why you do what you do. And that's psychology. And in the Enneagram, we're always looking for that unconscious motivation. We are mixed motives and you know our weaknesses are our strengths, so we have to create that compassion. But when we are young, we are inordinately committed to a way of building ourselves up, protecting ourselves from the world. And we're trying to find our strengths so this is where we have to pay attention to what we pay attention to because it was always there for us to, to feel good about ourselves and to strengthen ourselves. But then we overindulge it. We over-identify with this thing that we're focused on. And we get good at it. And even though it tortures us, we get good at what we're paying attention to. It's not essentially what you do, it's why you do it. And there's a core statement you made to yourself very young about how you should survive. And you made some commitments to yourself. Mine was, I will not be mediocre. 
I don't want to feel small. I don't want to feel insignificant. Why did I make that commitment? Because I felt small and insignificant in some way. And there was a fear of getting stuck there. And so whatever weird alchemy or, or uh, chemistry that was there pushed me towards envy. And then that envy pushed me towards trying to make myself this thing that stood out. It was a defense mechanism. Now, Enneagram uses a lot of different psychological disciplines and, and integrates them. And as the Enneagram has been around a little, it's gotten more enhanced. But we can look to Karen Horney's work, who, who worked with different ways to overcome fear, whether to be submissive and connect to others, whether to be hostile and aggressive and assertive, whether to withdraw and isolate and pull back. And we know that with the subtypes, you might learn this down the road or or you do know this, that there is defense mechanisms and there's social stances that we have that are there to protect us. And the psychological effects of leaning into them also create these problems because they were escape modes, they were defense mechanisms. And this is how we educate ourselves by looking back at the story. What do we value? What were we into and how do we protect ourselves? What was our primary defense mechanisms? And usually then we'll have to identify some trauma. Your trauma might be big, your trauma might be small. We call these passive wounds and active wounds. The active wounds are obvious. I got raped, I got physically abused, my parents uh, disowned me, whatever it is. And then there's these passive wounds that are a little harder. It's like my parents were good parents, but I have this thing that I'm trying to figure out. I don't know where it started. This is the archaeology that we have to do. Where did we feel helpless? Where did we feel hurt? Where are the things that got lodged in us that say we have to work through this by defending ourselves and finding ways to build ourselves up? That usually happened before five years old, folks. The personality is usually set there. But there is some things that were going on. And, and although you'll have some big moments after five and big traumas, a lot of this personality was developed there. And the Enneagram teaches us what to explore and focus on in this past. And now, currently, we're still focused on those things. I'm still worried about being mediocre. And this is part of the liberation that can happen. I don't have to stop wanting to not be mediocre, but I have to understand why I'm doing it and at where it can get in the way and when I could over-identify and over-clutch to that. Life is conflict between the organism, us, and our environment. And new things are created out of that. And our dissatisfactions lead towards this way of doing life because we think we'll get recognition for it. We revolt against feeling worthless. We revolt against feeling small. So whatever your number is, you were revolting in a way and you found a defense mechanism and it got kind of locked in and this is the design to protect yourself in life. So right out of the bat, we work with psychology here and we become psychoautobiographers. Go do the work. Remember things about your story. Write them down. Take them to somebody. Play with them a little bit. This is one of the disciplines that is ingrained in the Enneagram and it's worth us learning and understanding. I woke up today not thinking I was gonna film any of this stuff, but I think life is imitating art. And what I was trying to communicate throughout this process is that there is a revealing that happens in the Enneagram, a slow and subtle revealing. And when you first become aware of the Enneagram, it hits you in the face and you're a, you're getting a dose of a lot of nakedness that you're experiencing. You are exposed as we just talked about. But then we have to get more and more subtle. It takes a lifetime to observe, to find, to attach, to become intimate with ourselves. And so as we started, the clouds were covering this mountain range behind me. And now the peak this peak right here is almost revealing itself. And that peak over there is almost revealing itself. And this is life. 
There's things surging and massing inside of us, and we're trying to figure it out and get relationship to it. And peace and joy are so squirrely. They're so quick. They're like the marmots over here. Marmot is a type of squirrel. Go look up what the marmot is. You could feed them here and they let you pet them, but they also could be squirrely and, and tricky. And that's how hard it is to figure ourselves out. And there's things we put into our shadow. The stuff that we don't want others to see or we don't even see ourselves are put behind us. And it takes a long time to figure those things out. Because in a sense, we've denied them or disliked them. And we have to live in more intimacy with them. The Zen masters used to say that the, the face you had before you were born is what we need to go after. Think about that. The face you had before you were born. And as the clouds start to fade away and more of our true self is being found and, and we're trying to find those peaks to see that is the full fullness of our true self. We are training ourselves to find some answers. And, and I don't use that word lightly. This is a practice. The answers make us less tr uh, fragile, but the answers are things that we often don't want to approach or pursue because we want the quick fix. And when we voluntarily go into a place of discipline, okay, here's the discipline coming, of mindfulness. This is practice. And what I mean by mindfulness, I'm using a catch-all here. So we have meditation where you're kind of emptying, contemplation where you're focusing on certain things and trying to really go deep with them, solitude, silence, these disciplines that are mostly considered spiritual disciplines that allow us to get more acquainted with ourselves and then they elucidate and illuminate certain things that we otherwise wouldn't have known if we were moving around a lot and quick and busy and striving. These moments in which we become kind to ourselves and give ourselves a little of attention and we foster some of the harder to work on things, which is like being with self. What is that quote? I think it's Thoreau that says most of man's troubles can be uh, whittled down to the idea that they could not sit alone with themselves in a room. Cornell, had a uni uh, Cornell University had a study that suggested that the number one identifier of success in business and relationships was self-awareness. If you lack self-awareness, you will hinder your trajectory. And self-awareness takes time, methodical, patience, resilience. Otherwise, you look like a pinball bouncing around until you get sucked into the vortex. You may think, leave well enough alone. <laughs> Because so much of our life is defended and protected. It's easier to say like, I'm good the way I am or I know who I am. I had a client, new client come in who said, I, I know so much about me, but my husband wants me to be here. And within 10 minutes to 20 minutes, I was able to show her about five things she had no idea like she was doing. Just verbally. Just with her arms being crossed, with little ticks she had in her language. We don't know ourselves that well. There's this idea of veriditas, which I talk about in other videos, which is the idea of greening, spiritual greening, you know, becoming more uh, ripe and ready and more powerful. And so that takes time. And we have to be patient with ourselves because you can't possibly learn all that you need to know about yourself by figuring out your number. You then have to go investigate. And this is what the beauty of the Enneagram is. The numbers actually interplay and start challenging each other. But to do that, we have to go deeper and deeper. So in this area, this discipline, this study, mindfulness, we tap into a couple things here. We, we first become a noticer of ourselves. And then here's some catchphrases for you. The inner observer, the fair witness, a person who is observing themselves fairly, both good and bad. Uh, to be unmasked, to be a self-observer, to be a non-identifier. And this is meaning like to not identify so much with self that you miss self. We have to inflate our patience and be disturbingly compliant with time with us. This will allow us to deploy, deploy our resilience. The Enneagram tells you to wake up. That is the beauty of it. 
Don't go on autopilot. Don't go to sleep to yourself. Have some self-awareness. Notice the patterns. This isn't about autopilot. Catch yourself playing the easy playbook. It helps us know what's going on inside so we can mitigate, so we can self-report. Kind of go like, you're doing this, Drew. Notice you're doing this. To monitor. Okay, how is my insides working? Where do I want to go? And then become awake. So our strengths aren't overly exaggerated and they're harnessed and tested by reality. It seems complexing, but it is actually a simple way. The Enneagram is kind of a simple way of understanding ourselves and giving us a tool to get deeper and deeper into self. It just slowly and methodically reveals a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. But part of that is what we have to unknow. We have to unlearn a lot of the things we've learned in life to protect ourselves. They were all defense mechanisms to make us feel worthy or make us feel loved, make us feel like we aren't so alone. And then we overplayed them. And now we get to look at the structures and substructures internally that are our unconscious motivations, our passions, our compulsory or compulsive uh, habitual stuff. And, and this throughout the time of spirituality and transformation has always been the primary focus. Become self-aware. You think about um, Jesus' first sermon. He says, I want to come up and bind, unbind the brokenhearted. Set the captives free. Free the slaves. That is an act of getting more aware to yourself. Don't run away from yourself, but into yourself. So we have that archetype in Jesus. We have that archetype in Buddha also. The, 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 the name Buddha means the one who is awake. The one who is becoming more free to find true glory. Please read the first part of chapter 13 in John Steinbeck's book, East of Eden, when it talks about the glory of a man, as a man that knows themselves well, a person who knows themselves well, that first page and a half, this is the glory is that we actually unlearn a lot about ourselves. We don't just have unpartial truths, we have the full radical honesty. And to do this, we have to be disciplined and methodically going after the stuff that is hard to go after in meditation, contemplation, solitude, silence. These are beautiful uh, components that work as psycho uh, chiropractic. <laughs> Little adjustments, tweaks, right-sizing our ego, becoming in a way smaller and stiller so that we can have those peaks revealed. Did they just get revealed on the one side? Oh shit. That was my plan all along. But this chump over here, he's still hiding. Damn you. You didn't help me enough. I needed the full thing. Well, my friends, become a recognizer. And to do that, you won't have it happen overnight. It will take a lot of time with you, getting to know you, maybe getting you some spiritual influence from outside of you and allow some things to percolate. Why is this part of what I think the Enneagram offers? The Enneagram is so self-revealing. And as I talked about in that last session, it makes us naked. It reveals so much. So as we allow it to reveal things, then we get to tweak and adjust and get deeper in the woods and that requires discipline. Okay. All right, folks, you are in a restaurant in the East Village in New York City, and there are people behind me working. So I'm only gonna do this on one take, and I'm gonna hopefully not screw it up. But this is what a restaurant looks like. It is always active, it's always busy, there's always life going on, and this is the art of hospitality or the discipline of hospitality. And why am I bringing up hospitality? Well, for us, with these nine numbers that we're playing with, how do we be hospitable 
with all nine. Most people just learn their friggin' number and then they stop there. And they don't know what the other numbers are about. They don't know how to integrate them, but we have all nine numbers inside of us. So I have not shared this before, but I am actually invested in restaurants. I'm invested in three restaurants here in the East Village. And it's one of those things where I'm a little bit of an outsider here. The, the people behind me working and grinding right now know this industry really well. I come in and out. I don't have a say in what happens unless something really shitty happens to me here. But mostly I drink and I eat, but I do watch. I watch how people are interacting, how the kitchen staff is working with the bar, how the servers are interacting with the people that they're serving. It's something that I'm intrigued by. I've always been intrigued by it. But I love to look at how we are doing the same thing inside of us. How do we integrate? How do we become whole? And so when most people just learn their number and stop there, they're actually cheating themselves. You should be watching all the videos on all the numbers. Because how do you learn other people well if you can't learn yourself well on how all the numbers are represented inside of you? So this is hosp hospitality right here. It's nine place settings. And you're one of them. And the other eight, they're not your primary number, but they are integral to who the hell you are. And there's a lot of things going on inside of them, just like there's a lot of things going on in this restaurant right now. This is the morning here, and it's already busy. There's someone painting back here. Uh, X is in the kitchen. There's three core, very important characters that keep this place together, that run the show. And then there's the, uh, the owners are off fucking around somewhere in another state. Famed restaurateur Danny Meyer, owner of the Shake Shack and some of the best restaurants in New York City in the last 20 or 30 years, calls his brand of hospitality enlightened hospitality. And it exists when you believe the restaurant staff is there to be on your side. There's Sarah setting up the table for food tonight and X getting the kitchen ready. Food and drinks will be had. And hopefully joy and connection will be facilitated by the people that work on staff at this restaurant. Do you work on your behalf by understanding all nine numbers of the Enneagram? That is hospitality when we talk about the Enneagram. Hey, Haley. Haley is the host here and giving you that dose of hospitality right away. Hopefully working for you so you know she's on your side. And here is the table set and ready to go. Now, I said that those guys were screwing off in another state, but actually they are creating, I think, at least three more restaurants. Now, you're going to see my hand here. I screwed this up, but I'm not going to redo this because it was such a good improv thing I did walking through that door. But what do you feel when you first walk into a restaurant? Now, my partner, the guy that's in that other state, his name is Jay, and he's a great friend. We've traveled the world together, and we've also gone through some of the hardships of restauranting together. Him way more than me, as he started a long time ago and is on the ground all the time. He says this, hospitality to him is about selflessness. You allow room for people to live in a space and feel safe there. So what do you feel walking into any restaurant for the first time? Do you even register a lot of the intricacies? Now, Jay says that I want a restaurant that has no pretense, no judgment. So he hires that way. He picks certain neighborhoods and certain parts of states even to pick that don't have a pretentious vibe, that don't feel judgy when you walk in. But let's get into this. We have this table sitting in front of us. and Here's how I want you to conceptualize it. You're one of the place settings. To the right and left to you are your wings. Now, if you don't know what your wings are and you don't know what your subtypes are, go watch some of the other videos. They're helpful. But my wings are going to be the two numbers on either side of me. That's always the case. If you are a two, then it's going to be a one or a three. If you are a nine, it's going to be a one or an eight. 
I am a four, so it is a three and a five. But three was also my second highest score on my Enneagram test, and it is very real within me. So right away, we have three numbers that are represented at this table and represented inside me. We also have what the Enneagram folks consider a high side or a low side. That is, when you are in stress, you look a little bit like a certain number, and when you are thriving and secure, you look like another number. Now, I like to say that these numbers are both inside of us, and they both have the potential for good and bad. So we should learn them very early on. And mine, as a four, is one and two. So when I am healthy and secure, I look a lot like a one version of a two. Or sorry, a four, four version with a little one. And when I am unhealthy, I got a little two in me that makes my four look a little two-ish. Now, that also can work inversely where I get, you know, my two worked out and I really lean into my two and I learn it well and I let it sit at the table and eat with me, then I can tap into it and tap into the best parts of it also. Now, the negative parts of the one show up in me too. Now, I have to let that sit at the table at its proper place and invite it to feel safe and secure there. So I learn the one. I watch videos on the one, or I do videos on the one. I do videos on the two. I do my research. I let them feel safe at this table. Now, what about the other numbers? Well, we got one, we got two, we got three, we got four. They're already represented. We got five because it's a wing. Now, we got six. Now, six is probably the number that I have least access to. So maybe you consider it like sitting farthest away from me at the table. Well, it is my job to learn that person well, learn the sixth part of myself well. So maybe I need to give a little bit more attention to that person at the dinner party. Now, they might be a tougher number for me to get acclimated to or acclimatized to or, or invite in. Know the numbers that are hard for you to enjoy because <laughs> they might rub you the wrong way, but you need to learn them. Now, seven is part of my tri-type. A lot of people have asked me about a tribe type. You can look into this, but that is your number in every area of intelligence. Now, I already have my area of intelligence, two, threes, and fours. Four is my highest number in the area of the heart, where emotions are most felt. In the head, it's seven. It's the five, six, and seven are head people. Seven is my highest number there. Uh, I've just decided that by looking into those numbers, I didn't take a test for that, and you might do the same. Now, eight is my highest number in the gut. That's the other center of intelligence, your eights, nines, and ones. Now, that's my tri-type, four, seven, eight. Now, we have all these numbers represented except for the nine. Well, it's interesting that I have in my life, per number, nines are the most represented in my friendships. They're probably the easiest for me to get along with. They can frustrate me a lot too, but they are very enjoyable. So I'm very familiar with nines. They have been given a seat at the table. I've learned them well because I have so many people in my life that are nines, the good, bad, and ugly. <laughs> so that's how I integrate these numbers. I let them sit here and be uh, served at my table. I don't dismiss them. I don't just learn the four and say, the other eight numbers don't get a place here. I give them drinks. I give them food. I nourish them. In my own life, I research them over and over again because I want to be whole. And if there's nine numbers inside of me, I want them all to be represented well. So that is sitting at the table. There's Dana, a bar manager. As we move away from the table, we start to get a look at the restaurant moving and shaking. And there is the kitchen. Hey, homies, what's up? Now I turn around and, oh, there's Julio. Julio is our bar manager and a person who knows more about Mezcal than probably anybody you've ever met in your life. We have over 200 Mezcals here. This is a metaphor for our life. There's so many moving parts inside of us, just like there's so many moving parts inside a restaurant. 
And when we bring friends into our life, like this guy right here, this is Francesco Campari. Francesco is an actor and a director and a great friend. And I'm having dinner with him here today. Just think about how you can think about your life with hospitality. Bringing everything in, all nine numbers, enjoying all of them, disliking all of them at times, but learning them well. Don't cheat yourself, folks. You've got it in you to dissect yourself just a little bit more and have some fun with it. Drink some mezcal also and maybe eat some good food. Peace. It's an odd thing, attraction. What attracts us to people? And what do we find out after we are attracted to them, we connect to them, we build a relationship with them, that there is all these commonalities that we have. And two of my favorite authors are John Steinbeck and Carl Jung. And it turns out that both were gardeners. Now, I didn't know this when I started being attracted to their work, but as I found out about their lives, I found out that both of them were avid gardeners, constant gardeners. And so am I. So this is my garden here. This is at a family beach house. I've been working on this garden for nearly 10 years, painstakingly planting and pulling and digging up. And different seasons have different weeds. There's years where I hardly have any weeds come up. And then there's years where the thing is taken over by weeds. And what I love about the Enneagram is that a great metaphor for it is a garden. The idea that there are weeds and flowers, gifts and strengths, and also those things that trip us up, those traps, those things that pull us back and keep us living in a small story. So this discipline is called horticulture. Now, a hobby is gardening. I'm a gardener. I'm not a horticulturist, but I want to just for this sake, take us to the extreme, take us to the professional component of mastery of garden cultivation management. How does a horticulturist get size and taste and lushness and vigor out of a specific plot of the land? How do they see what threatens conditions and identify that and then de develop novel varieties? So we're going to look at my garden today. I'm going to take you through it and let you peruse with me as it grows throughout the spring and summer. And I am more of a floriculturist. I am somebody who loves ornamental uh, pieces, flowers specifically. So you're going to see a bunch of flowers here. So we're going to use that metaphor to anchor us. This idea that there are flowers in our lives, our strengths, and they are sitting right next to weeds. And if we don't pick those weeds, if we don't actively monitor this plot, this garden, to see where weeds can smother out the root systems of those beautiful things, then we're screwed. And the Enneagram so highlights, brutally so, what our weeds are and our beautifully strengths are. Got my garden here. Now look at this piece right here. I call this a piece because it's a piece of work. It actually looks pretty beautiful. It looks like this thing is gonna bloom a bunch of flowers. It's spring. So this thing looks like it has tons of potential. But actually, this is a huge weed right here. And what it's doing is actually taking over this whole area. So the flowers, the cone flowers that are around it are actually not getting proper sun. They're getting covered. And this root system is taking out this whole area. While we have over here, what looks like it could be actually weeds. But these are zinnias. And these are zinnias about to come up and they will be about, I don't know, waist high, full of flowers all summer long. And somebody might come over here and think these are weeds, but actually no. And this has been an area I've properly weeded out. I've gotten so much of the weeds out of here so it's not taking over the zinnias. This thing I have to get out of here. Now, this is kind of like our lives. We've got these weeds growing right next to all the beautiful flowers. And if we let it go too long, it takes over the whole system. And so what we have to do is kind of methodically start taking this thing down branch by branch, 
This might be therapy for you. It might be reading books for you. I mean, look at that root system. This thing is taking this whole area over. And this is kind of what I've been telling you guys is the flowers and the weeds are living right next to each other. And if we're not rooting out the weeds quick enough, they start to take over. And this is a big one. This is like anger in my life. I've told you guys before that anger is one of the things I struggle with most. This is the one that when it comes in, it comes in big and it's always around. And there's these other weeds that I can just kind of pick here. Got a weed here I could just pick. This is like the everyday stuff that you just see coming and you know you have to take care of it. But these big weeds, if we don't root them out, they're liable to take out our whole lives. And so this is the fun of letting these zinnias and these cone flowers get back their, their proper place. This is going to have actually cone flowers come all around it because I'm gonna take this out. I'm actually put, plant some seeds around that area. And that's what our life can look like. All right, this is my zinnia section. And in the zinnia section, these are all from seeds from last year. So last year, when the flowers die out, I take them and I deadhead them, pull off those tops, and I start peeling back like an onion or an orange, you're peeling off that rind. And then all of a sudden these seeds just start coming out. And this whole section is a massive amount of zinnia sprouts. There's too many actually for this section. Some of them are gonna have to fight for dominance. And when they fight for dominance, some are gonna probably die off or get smothered because they're just not gonna get the light. And the other ones are gonna to come to the surface. The cool thing about this is, this is kind of like our gifts in life. We have our gifts and we might have the potential to have 30, 40 gifts, but we have to deselect and narrow down. We have to, to kind of, sh I don't know, strip off some of the stuff that isn't our primary loves and let the priorities come. And that's the great thing about the Enneagram is like the flowers and the weeds are sitting right next to each other. But then when we see these flowers come up, we have to figure out what are our favorite flowers? What are the flowers we want to grow the most in certain sections? And then how will they utilize the ground, the water, the, the sun to really maximize their potential. I know that John Steinbeck and Carl Jung spent so many hours of their lives in their gardens just walking through, but also walking through their life, thinking about their own strengths, their own weaknesses, and how to work through them. There's this idea called veriditas. I talk about it a lot. I'm going to talk about it again in this video. The abbess Hildegard von Bingen came up with this idea. And an abbess is just someone who runs a nunnery. And she said, oh, most honored green force, you are enfolded in the weaving of divine mysteries. And what she took was two words. And those words together mean green and truth, veriditas, growth and vigor, the greening power of God, and it is to be sought out. To find our lushness, to find our freshness, our green color, we have to seek it out. So you're going to seek it out with me in this garden. We are going to root out the weeds of our own life, the unresolved, unhealed hurts, the things that get in the way, we're also going to look at those beautiful things, the greening power of what can be our strengths. We are destroyed also, though, by our gifts. So if there is too many focal energy on our strength, we overdo it. We over-identify. We become over-attached to our strengths. So we don't want to overwhelm our our garden with one flower. We have to diversify. We have to put things that complement. You have to make the choice. You've entered into this experience with the Enneagram. I'm sorry. It's going to kick your ass a little bit. But it is telling you to go do your work. Go do your gardening. There's this idea of heliotropism. This is when a leaf knows where the sun will be and follows it. You might see this with uh, sunflowers, where sunflowers are actually tracking the sun and the flower is moving with the sun. A tendency of animals or flowers or flora that move towards the light 
it, follow it. There's a solar tracking. And you have to decide what your solar tracking is. Is it therapy? Is it reading the books? Is it talking with a friend? Is it a combination of all those? I hope that the Enneagram is challenging you to look at your stuff more and more. To identify the corrupted stuff, the weeds. And then also the beauty. But then to like sharpen the beauty. Sharpen the gifting, the flowers. So that you can direct that energy. So as you age, you're rooting out. But also you're planting and and giving life to what's there. Now know this. You will never get all the weeds. Zero chance of it. You will end your life with some weeds in your garden. Your job is to pluck as many as you can, as fast as you can. And there will be seasons where it's just more difficult. I love what Carl Jung says about teachers. And I think a garden is a teacher. I think this metaphor goes far. He says, an understanding heart is everything in a teacher and cannot be esteemed highly enough. One looks back with appreciation to the brilliant teachers, but with gratitude to those who touched our human feelings. The curriculum is so much necessary raw material, but warmth is the vital element for the growing plant and for the soul of the child. Let the Enneagram grow you. Let it use its unique flavor and act as a piece of sun, water, soil. Cool? Thank you for joining me in my garden. And know that you can be a horticulturist at the top level emotionally. And if nothing else, at least be a hobbyist and be a gardener. Work on your garden a bit. Cool? Thank you for coming on this journey with me to learn about the Enneagram. Now is the time to just let this all integrate. Go for a hike, go for a walk, get in nature. Let all the ways in which I talked about how the Enneagram can be powerful for us be integrated for you. I'm halfway through a hike in Baja, Mexico, and I am just letting some of these truths sink in. In one of my favorite places, I'm gonna go take a dip in a cove. This is one of my favorite cactus back here. And I've just enjoyed our time together I'm going to put in my favorite test. It will be in the description. So if you want to take that test, read my instructions and just learn a little bit about yourself through the Enneagram. I've appreciated our time together. My name is Drew and get in touch with me. Tell me how this process is going for you. All right, folks, as I've always said at the end of all my videos, in the words of Rainar Marie Rilke, Everything is yet to be done. Everything. And that's never been so true to me as it is up here. Those are walruses in the background. Nope, nope, not walruses. Sea lions. Sort of the same thing. Enjoy the view, folks. Life's awesome, even when it sucks. There's lessons, there's transition, there's transformation. It is out there.